In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Wherever you are, please be seated. Sorry we're having a couple little glitches this morning. It's connected and then reconnected a couple times. So sorry if this gets interrupted. Just so you know, the sermon is always recorded and we post the whole thing later on our YouTube channel, so we should be okay. Well, I just want to let you know, I am, uh, I'm in a group chat with a bunch of guys that I went to college with up at Lawrence University, which is actually not very far from here in Appleton. There's 11 of us in this chat, and we were all in the same fraternity, Beta, Theta, Pi, if you must know. And we are, I guess the best way to uh, explain us is we're a ragtag bunch of men, uh, all of us in our mid to late 40s, just working through life the best we can. And our group is all over the place, be it physically, spiritually, life stagely. Some of us are married, some are divorced, some have stayed single. Some have kids, some don't. We're spread out from Delaware to D.C., from Michigan to Missouri, Oshkosh to Madison, Chicago to California. There's a lawyer in there or two, a retired opera singer, paralegal, a school teacher, businessman, life coach, and a priest. Now, some of the guys are actually into the whole Jesus agenda, Others grew up in the church as a part of their lives, but aren't into it as much anymore. Others have spent time away from faith communities, but are now finding their way back. Some are part of different kind of faith systems altogether, and some choose to participate in faith not at all. Most of them were at my wedding. All of them have been a part of some reunions that have taken place over the years. And in fraternity lingo, they are brothers but I truly think of these guys as my extended family. And, they, and a bunch of them know I'm preaching this morning, and some of them just might be watching. So Shane, Calvert, Delaney, Slater, Nick, Gartley, John, Sean, Tooch, and Ryan, in the words of Coach Norman Dale of the Hickory High School Indiana State Basketball Champs of 1952, I love you guys. Now I bring all this up because in various conversations that I've had with some of them, both in and out of our group chat, there's one question that gets brought up to the holy man in the group. Is all this God stuff even relevant anymore? Now, for some of you who are listening, that question might get your blood flowing a little quicker. You might even start to mentally search for a, a ready-made answer. Others of you might hear that question and you might be petrified to admit that you have asked or are asking right now that very same question. Is all this God stuff even relevant anymore? Now, it's not a bad question. We should always be able to ask questions, especially when it comes to issues of God and of faith. The passage that we heard this morning from Matthew 22 is actually a long string, it's part of a long string of questions that are being asked of Jesus. And because Jesus is offering this truly radical new way of inviting people to live their life with God, a whole bunch of different religious leaders keep coming up to Jesus and they have questions. Sometimes their question sort of reveals their motivation and they actually have a genuine desire to learn. Other times, they're just trying to justify their own way of thinking or to trap Jesus so they can expose him for the heretic that they believe them to be. I mean, it might be kind of difficult, but just think of a world where it might be, the, excuse me, think of a world where it might look like we focus on getting quick and easy yes or no answers to deep and complicated issues. Or imagine a world where we elevate individuals or groups of people based on how well they can stick it to someone else in a discussion or a debate. Things haven't changed much, have they? So what's the question that we hear in this section of Matthew's gospel? Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? I mean, they are basically asking, what's the one most important thing? What one thing do we need to make sure that we do? So, of course, Jesus gives them two things. 
I mean, it's like he's saying, Yo, you want a yes or a no? You want a quick and easy answer? Try this on for size. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Love God. Love your neighbor. Not one most important thing, two most important things. Or is it actually one thing with two parts? We're going to look at each part briefly, but please understand, I actually don't think that Jesus sees these as separate things. So, love God. I mean, how does that work? How have we as humans done that? Despite the overwhelming efforts by God to convey the truth that God is not confined to a thing like a, like a box or a statue or a symbol, and God is not kept in a place like an altar or a church or a temple, despite the reality that God is not limited or restricted to those things and places, we as humans like to do things such as build churches and temples and place things like altars and statues and symbols in them as a way to show our love of God. And these are good things to do. Please hear me. Like having physical locations where people can come and be reminded and be able to recognize and practice what it means to see the sacred and the divine and the love, the depth, the beauty. We need places like that in this world. The problem is, or, or can be, that once you create a space and call it sacred or holy, the temptation is that we then label other places not sacred or less holy. Several months before COVID hit, we were gathered together with some of our students, middle and high school, and one of them, in the midst of telling a story, they, they used a word that I think most people might, you know, label a curse word or find offensive. And before I could even say something like, hey, let's just be careful of the words that we use, another student blurted out, you can't say that word here. You're in a church. I've also been in groups of people where not everyone in the group knows I'm a priest. And someone will say something that some might find offensive and inevitably, somebody will elbow that person and be like, dude, you can't say that. Aaron's a priest. Now, because I rarely want to let a teachable moment slide by, I'll usually ask the question, so wait, is it not about what you say, but rather where you say it or who you say it around? I mean, like we build churches and display symbols and set up statues and, and gather in temples. But by choosing to only use those ways to show our love of the sacred and the holy and the divine, when we only express our love for God in this way, we are actually teaching ourselves that there is a sacred versus non-sacred divide in this world. But there isn't. Because what did the psalmist write? Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord and all that is in it. Not just the symbols and the statues, not just the altars and the churches. What is the writer saying? The whole thing is a temple. The whole thing is a temple. This God, this divine love on earth doesn't have any edges or boundaries or limits. Which then begs the question, how is God not relevant? This brings us back to the concept of does Jesus answer the greatest commandment question by giving just one answer after all? Perhaps his answer is more along the lines of love God, love neighbor. Like, like it's a hashtag with no spaces, no punctuation, no separation. Which brings us to love your neighbor. How does that work? How have we as humans done that? Sometimes we've been pretty okay with that. Other times, nah, not so much. And while I do believe that this command, love your neighbor, this invitation by Jesus is meant for everyone, I think there's a specific question that the church needs to hear. What if the church put energy and resources into creating spaces for people to ask questions? Like I'm talking about sacred spaces where people can be reminded that there is such a thing as mystery in the world. 
Because again, our society puts so much value on having the right answers or asking questions in order to trap or label someone. And I don't know about you, but that just feels like a, a way of not loving your neighbor. Don't get me wrong, answers to life's big and small questions, they're great. But we also know that there are things that we experience that answers don't really solve or address. Things like pain, loss, joy. I mean, I found that people would rather someone just sit with them instead of handing out answers or out of context Bible verses. Because this whole thing is a temple. And because this whole thing is a temple, it means that everything we do, every facet of our lives, is an opportunity to see and participate in the wonder, the beauty, the love, the sacred, the divine. Married, divorced, single, kids, no kids, Delaware, DC, Michigan, Missouri, Oshkosh, Madison, Chicago, California, lawyer, retired opera singer, paralegal, school teacher, businessman, life coach, priest, Love God. Love your neighbor. Because it's all a part of the temple. Amen. Father Aaron will adjust the camera angle. If you have a sermon, please put them in Facebook or YouTube. And uh, Father Aaron will try to converse with us and read them. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, some, someone, our, our, our dear friend Maggie said, ha ha, out of context Bible verses <laughs> that, that made her chuckle. And, and I, I'm, I don't mean to make light of scripture in, in, in that sense, mm -hmm. but there are times, and I've done it too, where I try to come up with a passage from scripture or, or something quick to say. And because I know a lot of the scripture, I can try to go, oh, well, this might fit that situation. And sometimes it can, and sometimes it can bring comfort. But a lot of times I feel like that's my agenda of wanting to fix your problem with some ancient words. Yep. Um, and that might not be what's needed at that time. Jesus could have asked them, why are you asking this question? Mm. And he went that a different route. But that is something that we can do. Why did they ask that question? Why do we ask the question? Or why do we hide our real question? And that's the real trick, isn't it? Because I frequently, if not always, bring my own stuff to any conversation. And so therefore, I might have questions that I'm desperate to make sure that no one else finds out that I've got. Um, and certainly, I mean, I, I think of like, like, like Nicodemus, who, who genuinely comes asking questions because I think he wants to learn. Um, and yet, he, the text says, I believe, he comes to him at night, which could mean that he does come to him after the sun has gone down, or it could be a very veiled way of saying he came when no one else would know that Jesus would, when, when no one else would know he was talking to Jesus. Uh, and so I don't, I'm not sure I want my questions always aired, you know, so that God or other people can hear them. So. I, I think maybe it protects us from God's goodness. Mm. I, I'm rereading C.S. Lewis's science fiction. In the beginning of Paralandra, a character encounters a divine being and can tell it's good, it's a good being, but is very uncomfortable and wants to back away from goodness mm. because it changes how he sees himself. Yeah. Well, it, it, that's so funny because someone literally just messaged, I think the whole love your neighbor as yourself comes into the equation. And I really didn't touch on that in the sermon. There's too much to say, right? I mean, there's just so much to say. But that's, that's really true. Like if, if I'm only loving others from a position of, but, or, 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 and it's a case of where I, I don't feel all that great about myself, I'm probably not loving my neighbor in the way that 
God loves me. Um, because I think there's this unconditional love that comes overflowing each of our lives. Hard to, hard to recognize sometimes. Where can I find my limit? How far does this love stuff go? And where can I find my safe place to stay behind instead of going all the way out here? So it's like, what, what, what are the limits to love? That's a complicated question because there are and there aren't. Well, and like the ready-made answer is, well, there's no limits. God doesn't have any limits of love, so you shouldn't either. But it's like, well, we don't live that way. We, we don't speak that way. We don't act that way. We certainly don't vote that way, not to get political, but we don't, mm -hmm. you know, like we choose to limit the, you know, I can't love that candidate. I can't love that person. They, they have some really whacked out ideas. And so therefore I will not engage with them or, I, or I'll engage in an unhelpful way and display all sorts of not love to them. In, in the gospel lesson, we are the ones testing Jesus. Yeah. Very true. And we don't like to be those characters in the Bible, but that's why they're there, for us to see ourselves. Yeah. So someone commented about just having conversations with other people and asking them, like, what do you admire about someone that you care for? Or what do you admire about someone that you dislike? You know, go, go take it the other direction and go, mm -hmm. what are some things that I truly do admire about that other person where I might not actually agree with them on a couple of things. Um, where, where can I find that common love ground? Well, when we think about it, we want others to put the things we say in the best light. And loving our neighbor would be me putting the things Aaron is saying in the best light. Yeah. Even if they're things I disagree with, how do I put those in the best light? Because spoiler alert, we don't think the same on everything. <laughs> but you asked me several years ago, not even several years ago, maybe only a year ago, have we ever had like an actual like fight or argument? And I don't think either of us could remember a time where we, <laughs> we had like, yeah, we, we've had conversations about like we've different things. We've not but, seen things the right, same way. Right, right. And we don't always see things the exact same way, but we've never like, you know, and so we've just been like, okay, yeah. Let's keep working together. <laughs> so, good. We get tempted to say, you are such and such. And we, when we are loved, we don't want to be loved in such a way that somebody else describes who we are. Mm. That needs to be for us and God. Mm. And yet we take that power quite often and say, you are, or Aaron is such and such. Yep. And that's a danger because that, that takes into account our very selves and our relationship with God who really determines our identity. Yep. As much as I like Aaron, he doesn't determine who I am. <laughs> it's a really, really good news. <laughs> <laughs> That's the gospel. Yeah. And yeah. it really is the gospel. Truly. truly. That even your own negative thoughts about yourself or anybody else's negative thoughts about you do not, not determine yep. your identity. That's a you and God thing. And then hopefully the rest of the church comes around with God in the relationship with you. Yep. yep. Good. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that sermon. Amen.